Arthur. Debbie, did you start the music? Did I start? You don't hear the music? Now I do. Okay. Before before we get started, is everyone able to hear me on this laptop? How's my audio? You're a little soft, Jim. Okay. Um, but okay, I'll just shout. But <laughs> is this good? Is this all right otherwise? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready to start admitting folks? Can we have the music? Yeah. Debbie, I think you need to restart it. I think we need to let people in and skip the music and just show the announcements. Please.
Good morning. Welcome to the Boise Unitarian Universalist virtual worship service. We are so glad you have joined us today for our virtual worship service on this independence holiday that we acknowledge with its fraught history. We know you have a busy weekend and we're grateful you've made the choice to join us in our Liberation Day revival. Reverend Sarah is on vacation this week. I heard she escaped the heat by visiting Southern California. I'm Deborah Smith, your celebrant this morning. You'll hear a little bit more about our speaker, Chris, in a minute. But right now I'd like to welcome any newcomers we have visiting us today. If you would like to introduce yourselves by commenting in the chat, one of our ushers will welcome you more personally. We're happy you are here. May you find the sustenance you seek. There are two announcements I'd like to highlight. The Pagan Nature Centered Spirituality Group will be meeting in person on Friday, July 9th at 7 p.m. on the fire pit or in the fire pit or at the fire pit on our grounds. And I want to remind everyone to spread the word that we have an opening for a part-time 10 hours per week audio-visual technician who will help us transition to a hybrid in-person slash remote form of worship this fall. As we gather together, even virtually, we want to acknowledge that the land upon which our church and our homes exist is the ancestral land stolen from the Shoshone Bannock, the Shoshone Paiute, Coeur d'Alene, Kootenai, and Nez Perce tribes, and many tribes whose names have been lost in history, all of whom inhabited a vast region, including much of Idaho, before they were rounded up and forced to leave. This land has a long history, long before colonization. We acknowledge that our presence here today is founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. With this acknowledgement, we wish to demonstrate a commitment to the ongoing work of dismantling the legacies of colonialism, honoring the indigenous people's connection to the land and supporting their right to sovereignty. In the challenges of these truths, may we move through the world, bringing justice in every way that we can, listening to the truths spoken to us by Native American peoples, making space for them to re-inhabit this place and giving them back the resources they need to heal their communities. For today's service, we welcome guest preacher, Chris Crass. Chris is an anti-racism educator who has dedicated his professional life to building a powerful movement that joins working class, feminist, and multiracial interests together for the common purpose of collective liberation. Chris has prepared for us a revival for racial justice, revival for collective liberation, and it will be an interactive service, and you will all be invited to smaller breakout rooms during worship. Continuing in the spirit of last month's theme of play, we celebrate the value of joy joyful spaces like this online fellowship that sustain the struggle and nourish our souls to undergo growth. Joyful spaces bring us together to listen and to learn, to mourn and to heal, and ultimately to grow in love. Today on this traditional day of celebration, we recognize the unfinished work of freedom and acknowledge that it does not come from a declaration or a piece of paper, but from a commitment to learning, unlearning, and relearning. And our UU principles remind us that freedom is intrinsic. It cannot be given by another, yet it is also collective a principle which we must strive to affirm and promote in order to support the collective thriving of all people and all communities. Let us take a moment to breathe together 
so that we can find a place of stillness in our bodies and prepare ourselves for the words we will hear this morning. Breathe in. Take in the offering of oxygen from the life-giving trees and then give back to the vegetable world the exhalation from your own body. Again, breathe in. And out. This simple act of breathing done consciously reminds us of the interdependence of all things. May this awareness be with us as I recite our ritual prayer by the Reverend Kendall Gibbons. Thou art the song of my heart in the morning. Thou art the dawn of truth in my soul. Thou art the dew of the roses adorning. Thou art the woven whole. Thine is the grace to be steadfast in danger. Thine is the peace that none can destroy. Thine is the face of the need-driven stranger. Thine are the wings of joy. Thou art the deep to the deep in me calling. Thou art a lamp where my feet shall tread. Thy way is steep past the peril of folly. Thou art my daily bread. Thine be the praise of my spirit uplifted. Thou art the sea to each flowing stream. Thine be the days that are gathered and sifted. Thou art the dread, deathless dream. Deserves to be 
Amen. At this hour in small towns and big cities, in living rooms and ornate sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalists are also lighting a flaming chalice, reminding us that we are part of a great community of faith. If you have a chalice nearby, you are invited to light it with us this morning. And if you like, hold your chalice up to the camera and while uh, we all click gallery view to see all the chalices being lit this morning, then you are also invited to share in the chat where your chalice is lit. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love. With our collective chalices lit in all of our spaces, we offer you this call to worship from the 14th century Sufi poet Hafiz. The small man builds cages for everyone he knows while the sage who has to duck his head when the moon is low, keeps dropping keys all night long for the beautiful rowdy prisoners. Come, let us all be the sages who worship together. I invite everyone to cozy up for our Time for All Ages this morning. Have you ever stopped what you were doing and thought to yourself, hey, that was really unfair. Maybe it was a comment someone made or a rule that you were told to follow or a way that you saw someone being treated. I wonder, what kinds of things have you noticed are unfair? When something stops you from expressing yourself or from being safe, or when it's applied differently to different people, this is a big way we can see unfairness happening in our lives. We see racism and ableism and other inequalities play out like that. Racism is unfair. Imprisoning people is unfair. Not giving everyone health care or housing is unfair. Not being listened to or not having a chance to understand and have a say in the things that affect you is unfair. All of these things speak to our principles, our eight principles. Recognizing unfair actions and unfair rules takes careful listening to our own intuition and values and to others explaining their hurt and their experiences. We were given a rule with so many rules that hurt people and keep us focused really on our own safety and comfort instead of each other's. 
our UU values say that everyone's role, everyone has a role in changing this, which is why our church and so many other UU churches believe it's important to talk all of the time and everywhere we go about what justice and fairness looks like for regular people. So what do we do about unfairness? Our story this morning is going to help us think about how to respond to rules that are unfair or outright hurtful. It's called We Say No by John Seven and Jenna Christie. And they have this to say about their book. Sometimes people don't act very fairly. And sometimes people in charge won't do anything about it. It might even be the people in charge who don't act fairly. When they act like bullies, maybe they act like bullies. And you tried talking and asking nicely, but that didn't work. When that happens, you have to take care of things yourself. There we go. Hope everyone can see. The Wonder Board is back, and so is my little microphone. There we go. So, we say no. Maybe you've had enough of biggies and maddies and meanies and bullies and baddies and grabbies and fools, which is all of our little villains around here. Tell them what you think. Stop. And tell them what you think and make lots of mischief. Talk to strangers. Hear unexpected things and think new thoughts. These folks are talking to each other. They're saying, let's revolution. Or these books have great ideas. Or we've got a Band-Aid. It's one of our friends in this group. And they say, free healthcare for all. That's what they're most passionate about. Someone says, I heart passive resistance. Or flowers are important. Someone down here is offering to help. They say, I can carry snacks. So then they revolutionize. Form a smiling mob. If they build statues, such as this one, to our handsome overlord, Improve it. I think that's a big improvement. When they ruin stuff, here they are chopping down trees. It's time to fix it. We've got someone planting little flowers to go right over and heal. Our trees, my pardon. When they tell you to buy something like very fancy and expensive apples, you know what to do. You say no. Difference is good. Difference makes us all stronger. Make friends with people who are different than you. And we see some of the kids chatting with some of the meanies and they say stuff like, would you like my extra kazoo? They look surprised. They're like, uh, okay, I guess. And I would like to hear about how you float, 
even though this is one of the meanies, they aren't being mean back to them, especially not about their body. It's a big act of kindness. Don't be fooled. Here's someone on TV and they say, trust me, believe me. And one of the other meanies is helping out and they say, giving some advice, don't listen to that. Maybe don't trust them. Instead, when they say, look at this, don't. Paint pictures over your TV. Believe your own eyes. I think that we have officially got an accomplice and not a meanie out of that person. If something is taken, like our band-aid friend, then we take it back. Leave smiley notes everywhere. Kind thing for strangers to see. Resistance shouldn't be boring. Have fun. Make up dance moves. Create art, like this meanie is creating art. I can't really call them a meanie anymore, huh? They're helping out. We have someone in our dance crew who says, I call this dance move the Noam Chomsky. Sometimes drawings say it better than mouths. Stuff like, we matter on this rainbow. Paint on all the walls, make comics. Paint on all the walls, make comics. Our board is filling up with actions. If they listen in on you, find a new way to communicate. Let me say, I love talking sideways. If someone feels scared, help them feel safe. Here we are inviting someone into a safe party. If they build up a wall, we tear it down. Work together, no bosses. Sometimes being quiet at this protest, this seated protest, is way better than yelling. Okay, I'm just kind of covering other stuff up. And remember, the revolution is only over when we say it's over. Yeah. The authors end our book with this final note. You can practice resistance. You can even have a revolution. Resistance means taking action against people who aren't acting fairly. Revolution means to change things. If something is not right, you, have a rev you can have a revolution and you can have a revolution a bunch of different ways at once. The most popular kind of revolution is when people march down the street in a big crowd, carrying signs, chanting and making sure the people in charge know what the ordinary people want. The very best kind of revolution is one where people don't get hurt. Whatever kind of resistance you choose and whatever revolution you decide to be part of, we hope it is part of an effort to make the world a better place because the world can always be better than it is. So I wonder, what do you say no to? And you say no to bullies, no to fear, no to mean, no to hurting the planet. Maybe your no is a yes. What do you say yes to? Yes to science, yes to being kind to each other. What do you want to say yes to? 
What rules do you think it's time to break and ought to be broken? When is a time you stood up against unfairness and who was there to help you? So I invite everyone to sing, to join in singing our community blessing as we celebrate this multi-generational community full of ever learning, ever loving, ever growing beloveds. Thank you all. We connect to our fellowship by sharing the joys that delight our souls, and we share the burden of our griefs with each other so that they might be lifted or at least lightened. If you have a joy or sorrow to share with us, please write it in the chat so that others can share with you. We hear that from Ken Watts this morning who shares this joy. I just got home from a trip to Texas to see my newest grandson, had lots of time holding him and enjoying time with my daughter and other grandson. And Diana Barrera Lowe shares this heart-wrenching sorrow. My friend Letha was with her two-year-old grandson in the Publix grocery store in Royal Palm Beach, Florida, two weeks ago when a man shot her and her grandson and then killed himself. It was a random senseless act of violence and her family and friends have been devastated by the event. Our sorrow is overwhelming. Please keep us all close in your hearts and thoughts. May we hold close in our hearts these joys and sorrows. And though we each travel our own life's journey, may we feel how deeply we are connected to one another. Blessed be. Amen. In the ongoing work of freedom, we dedicate ourselves to collective liberation and the thriving for all people. We build on the legacy of those whose stories were left untold for so long, and we commit to the continued learning and unlearning with which we must engage. We make space during our service for generosity of spirit to move us to give to this self-sustaining community for the work we must do, to live in alignment with our values, our ideals, and highest aspirations, and for building up a world of radical welcome and love. And we delight that a portion of our weekly offering can support this month's plate partner, the Idaho Food Bank. We thank you for your generous giving today and always. Thank you.
It is so beautiful to be here with all of you. My name is Chris Crass, and I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. In the video that we just saw, the Revival Resistance Chorus of the uprising that was shaping this country last year. At this time, we were in the early, the month of uprising, continuing through the summer into the fall, and in Louisville, Kentucky, 
Breonna Taylor and the movement for justice for Breonna Taylor along with George Floyd and with so many others. And in Louisville, Kentucky at this time last year was a massive uprising of daily protests of people taking to the streets of people saying, say her name, Breonna Taylor. And in Louisville, Kentucky, I want all of you in Boise, Idaho, and those of you joining from Oklahoma to also know Kentucky both as the land of Breonna Taylor and the justice movement for Breonna Taylor, as well as the land of a growing black political progressive movement. The names of Charles Booker, who is taking on Rand Paul for Senate, the names of Attica Scott, who is an incredible black elected official at the state house here in Kentucky, who is leading movements for justice. It is crucial. This service is a revival, a revival for racial justice, a revival for collective liberation, because I don't know about you, but how many of y'all out there need some nourishment for justice? Some nourishment to do the work that we are committed to, the work that our faith, our spirituality, our principles call us into being nourishment for our hearts, for our souls, for our humanist and theistic minds. Y'all need some nourishment out there? Because I know that in this work, it can feel overwhelming. Am I right? And I encourage all of you out there, if you're able to turn on your videos, because this is going to be an interactive participatory service. So if you're able to turn on your video, go for it. If you're able to open up your chat, go for it, because we're going to be interacting here and engaging. I'll be asking some questions here for you to put in the chat for some people potentially to speak, to, to share. And we're going to be doing a small group breakout soon because this service, a revival for racial justice, a revival for collective liberation is about honoring and nourishing our hearts and our minds and our souls in our beloved community as Unitarian Universalists and in our work. And I was honored to be able to talk with your minister, Reverend Sarah, and learn more about your congregation and the vital work you all are doing in Idaho and in the city of Boise, as well as within your congregation of adopting the eighth principle, helping to lead our denomination forward in that work. And also not just adopting an eighth principle, but deeply committing to what does it mean to live the eighth principle? And that's what this is all about. How do we live our values imperfectly, messy, nuanced, complicated, but also beautiful? And so in thinking about this 4th of July, hundreds of years of struggle for an expansive, multiracial, feminist, democratic society struggling for writing for vote for voting rights for political rights for economic rights for working people for people of color for women for lgbtq people for all of us for an expansive collective liberation and so in thinking about nourishment in thinking about this work of expanding multiracial democracy, of expanding feminist democracy, both historically as well as today. We need nourishment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into groups of three. And again, I invite you to turn on your camera and we're going to get into groups of three. I want you to take a moment to think about some, when you think about this, working to expand democratic rights, when you think about expanding economic justice, multiracial democracy, working class dignity and justice and fair wages, a fair economy that doesn't just benefit the billionaires, but is actually a society that is economically just for all of us. I want you to think about somebody who inspires you to be in the work for justice, for multiracial democracy. This could be somebody who you know, 
who's in your family, who's in your congregation, who's in your community. It could also be somebody who you've read about, whose poetry moves you, whose, his, whose history you've studied, but somebody who inspires you. And I know from talking with your minister that many of you have been engaged in legislative fights at the state level that have been discouraging. And so I want you to think about somebody who inspires you even when you need it the most when you're discouraged, when you're disheartened. So think about somebody who inspires you. You got your person? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into groups of three, and we'll have eight minutes, eight minutes in our groups of three for everyone to share a paragraph, speak, speak about a paragraph of who their person is, and then a whole page about what about them inspires you. Go for it. And for those of you who are still in this larger space, either feel free, those of you who are on camera who weren't able to get into smaller groups, you can feel free to unmute and share. Or if you're wanting more of a quiet meditative time to think about your person who inspires you, feel free to journal or meditate about your person. But I believe uh, Nan is helping to get people into their small groups. But if you're still here in this, this bigger group, you know, feel free to share. And, and Nan, I'm going to send to you a direct message with the question if you want to send that out to all the breakout groups. And I just sent that to you, Nan, if you're able to send that out to all the breakout groups. And Miriam or Jean or anyone else who's who's here, if you if you want to unmute and share about your person, go for it. Um, or also, if you're able to join your small group, go for it.
How much more time do you want to give them? Did you have it set for uh, eight minutes? No, I was I was going to go in and do it manually. Oh, OK, great. Um, how about we do uh, just another like two minutes? Sounds good. And Nan, I'll aim to go to about like a 110 and then we can go to the video. The, the, and I'll just say a word about the, about that song. And okay. then like, you know, like, thank you all so much for having me here. And the next, you know, some I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll try to end it on, you know, thank you so much for having me all here and then go to the song. Sounds good. It's a great song. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I, it's been a it's been a good one over these past six months. So, is it just one minute now? I should close the rooms in a yeah. minute. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone's starting to come on back. We'll wait as everyone starts to reunite here. All right. Thank you all so much for engaging in conversation with each other. And right now I want to invite you to open up your chat. Open up your chat. And at first just share in the chat any words or a phrase of just how did it feel to be in conversation with other people in your congregation or other Unitarian Universalists to, to, to have that conversation with others. just how did it feel? Any feelings that came up? And just put those in the chat or feel free if one or two of you want to unmute and just say a word of what any feelings that came up for you. So energizing community, the kind of connection during this pandemic to be able to connect with others, to be inspiring, to be together, warmth, enjoyment, focusing on positives after a challenging year here in Idaho. Absolutely. It's beautiful to share these feelings. And for some of us, there may have also been sources of sadness, potentially, of having a hard time of thinking about different sources of people who have inspired us, or feeling like some of us might have a whole village of inspirational people from our past, from history, in our families, in our communities. Some of us might be in a place of we're searching for, we're hungry for sources of inspiration. 
And I just want to say that one of the reasons we do this is to create a culture of memory, a culture of inspiration, because supremacy systems, white supremacy, patriarchy, economic exploitation of capitalism, systems of supremacy want us to feel disconnected, want us to feel isolated, and want us to have historical amnesia about the ways that working people, the ways that everyday people have made monumental positive changes, and to have an overwhelming sense of despair. Racism, sexism, economic exploitation want us to feel that they can never be challenged, that we can never win. The South African anti-apartheid movement, they had a saying, revolution is the struggle of memory against forgetting. The revolution is the struggle of memory against forgetting, forgetting our victories, forgetting our sources of inspiration, sources that can nourish us and to only feel overwhelmed. And so now I want you to share in the chat. And again, a couple, if one or two of you want to unmute and share, what about your people? We're not going to talk about our people now. But just what about our people inspired us? And so you feel free again to share a word or a sentence in the chat about what about your person inspires you. And then if one or two of you want to unmute and share into the whole group, what about your person inspires you? You can raise a hand or just unmute. The words coming through on the chat of undaunted, persistent, vulnerable, hope, endless love, empathy without judgment, finding the positive. And so being able to connect to the positive, being able to connect to what helps move us forward is a skill is a skill because often as social justice activists, we can be the bringers of bad news, which is an important role that we play. The world sucks. There are systems of oppression that sucks. There's injustice that suck. And sometimes we ourselves suck even trying to make positive change. Am I right? And that's all true. We all suck on some level trying to live our values, trying to live our spirituality, trying to be justice movement people, trying to be good Unitarian Universalists. It's not about not sucking because we all suck on some level. I suck on all kinds of levels. As a dad, as a social justice activist, trying to live my values in this world. But it's about connecting to in the grace, in the beauty of who we are, doing the best we can, learning and growing, making mistakes and learning from our mistakes, we build progressive political power, spiritual power to nourish us. One of the people who I think of as a source of inspiration is a woman named Zilphia Horton, a white anti-racist who grew up in Arkansas in the 1920s. She went on to become one of the co-founders of the Highlander Center in East Tennessee, a movement training center in the 30s, the 40s, that continues through today. The Highlander Center was started as a place to support working class people to develop their political understanding of systems of oppression and to fight for economic, racial, and gender justice. The Highlander Center in the 1930s was training union organizers in the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the leading working class organization union drive effort in the 1930s that helped bring us the New Deal. Social Security. 
Medicaid, Medicare in the 1960s coming from social justice movements as well. In the New Deal, a change of how the economic system, again, imperfect, long ways to go, but the CIO was able to win massive monumental changes that impacted positively the lives of working class people. Zelfia Horton was helping to train union organizers in the 1930s. In the 1950s and the early 1960s, Zelfia and the Highlander Center were the meeting ground for Rosa Parks to get trained in nonviolent civil disobedience that she then brought back to Montgomery. Ella Baker, that song we heard, Ella's song about Ella Baker, one of the leading civil rights movement organizers in the 50s and 60s, they would meet, Ella Baker would meet at the Highlander Center with a white anti-racist from Louisville, Kentucky named Ann Braden. Ann and her husband, Carl, Carl, a white working class anti-racist socialist in Louisville, Kentucky in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the Bradens were organizing white Southerners in the, in, throughout the region and then white people throughout this whole country to join in the black led civil rights movement to expand multiracial democracy, to fight for economic justice. And I think of Ann Braden, who then mentored a whole generation of white anti-racist LGBTQ multiracial organizers here in Louisville, Kentucky many of whom are aunties and uncles to my kids. My kids get to march in the streets for Black Lives Matter, for economic justice, for working class dignity and rights with those who were mentored by Ann Braden, Ella Baker, who were trained at the Highlander Center. And Zelfia Horton not only focused, and the thing about her that really deeply inspires me, is that she didn't just focus on the analysis we need to have or the principles that we need to be trying to live as Unitarian Universalists. Zelfia Horton focused on how people felt, how people learned through experience, through singing together, through sharing food and stories with each other, stories about our lives, Stories about the people who inspire us so that we bring our hearts to each other. And as people who are committed to social justice and building spiritual community as Unitarian Universalists, how we help people feel welcomed, how we invite people into justice movement, how we create culture that is warm and generous as well as engaged in thinking about how we live the eighth principle as you all are in your congregation now. But the reason we're focusing on a revival for racial justice, a revival for collective liberation, is that the energy that we have, because we are not just the bearers of bad news, of more legislation attacking critical race theory, which is just an excuse, critical race theory is just an attack on all education from K through 12, through higher education that engages an anti-racist education of any form whatsoever. So me learning as a teenager about Ella Baker, about Ann Braden, about people who could inspire me and motivate me as a white person to deeply engage in anti-racist work as a heart affirming, soul nourishing vision and values of anti-racism, of ending the death culture of race. How many of y'all out there wanna end the death culture of racism? The death culture of white supremacy. And so critical race theory is nourishment, education, is, is any kind of anti-racist education that they're going after right now with this attacks on critical race theory legislation from Idaho all over the country. And so sometimes we lose, but we continue to build and invite more and more people into this work. And our, our responsibility is to not just be the bearers of bad news, of the attacks on critical race theory, on the, the, the attacks on, on voting rights. 
which is a reaction to the uprising last summer, which is a reaction to historic numbers of people of color, of voting registration. It's a reaction against progressive change. We must also be the bears of liberation nourishment to help people feel connected to sources of inspiration, of historical movements that can move us and inspire us, of our singing, of being able to pray and have rituals together that nourish our people. So I want you to think, and you can share in the chat, and again, if anybody wants to unmute and share, what are sources of nourishment for you? We talked about somebody who inspires us. But what are other sources of nourishment for you that help keep that fire of our chalice alive, that keep our, that keep our hearts and our minds open, engaged, inspired? So anything you want to share in the chat of any practices or, or other people or justice movements, anything that inspires you, that nourishes you, share in the chat. And, or if one or two of you want to unmute and again, share out loud, bring your voice into the space. Absolutely. Spending time with children. What else? Absolutely. Books and poetry. Keep on bringing it. What are the sources of nourishment for us? Music, sitting in silence, my granddaughter. Stories, absolutely. And so when we think about justice work, it can often feel challenging to say the least, heartbreaking. Our spiritual tradition, our humanist secular tradition, our faith, our hearts for justice, they call on us to also be beacons and holders of historic memory of examples of ways that people in the past have worked for justice, victories that we have won, that our people, our ancestors have won. I encourage us as a spiritual practice for myself, whenever I see something, a devastating news headline, I try to seek out two or three examples of ways that people are doing positive, beautiful things in their communities ways that people are trying to fight back and work for justice to maintain sources of inspiration. Meditation, poetry, hugs, time alone, all of these are important sources of nourishment. So as we do this work, let us think about as Zelfia Horton did, not just the analysis, not just the the, the written word, although the written word can be powerful, but also about singing together, sharing food together, sharing stories of nourishment, social justice nourishment, rooted in a literacy of our people's history. Because the attack on critical race theory The attack on people's history is an effort to keep us in amnesia about how everyday people throughout history have made incredible changes. And last summer, we bring up the uprising because as we talk now about voter suppression, about reactionary efforts that are trying to move our country in a way that limits democratic rights, It's crucial that we remember even last summer in the victories of last summer in the victories of what we are trying to do. So literacy about our history of our people, literacy about nourishment for justice and to remember that we're in this together. We're gonna close now. We're gonna close now with a song from Woody Guthrie, written in 1944, 
done by the Revival Resistance Chorus. And I just thank you so much for having me here, for being a part of this, and let us continue to nourish our movements for justice from Idaho to Kentucky to all over this country to expand on the 4th of July to renew our commitment to expansive, multiracial, feminist democracy. So with love to you all, with nourishment for y'all, let's get free. And thank you for leading our denomination forward with the eighth principle. Now we're gonna close with some Woody Guthrie and the Revival Resistance Chorus. Can you perhaps restart this so that we can hear the sound? Thank you.
And now, beloveds, I invite you into the spirit of prayer. Put your hand over your heart or grab the hand of someone next to you. Spirit of life and love, mysterious, ineffable source of all holy yearnings. We give thanks for that germ of an idea, that product of fitful, deliberate evolution, that alternative underground narrative, that tentative self-conscious whisper that became a demanding shout that would howl down the hierarchies, that would establish once and for all that insistent, persistent, provocative notion that we all have inherent dignity and worth. And if we have not reckoned with the all of the all of it, then we have more work to do. We know we have more work to do. And for that, we are grateful for the opportunity to grow closer to that ideal, to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of the petty exclusions that limit the all. In the name of all that is holy and all who are holy, we pray. Amen. Yes. I will stand with you. Will you stand with me, and we will be the change that we hope to see in the name of love, in the name of peace. Will you stand, will you stand with me when injustice raises up its fist and fights to stop us in our tracks? We will rise, and as one resist, no fear nor sorrow can turn us back. I will stand with you, will you stand with me, and we will be the change that we hope to see in the name of love, in the name of peace. Will you stand, will you stand with me? When pain and hatred churn up angry noise and fight to drown out our freedom song, we will rise in one joyful voice, loud and clear and ever strong. I will stand with you. Will you stand? you to place your hands over your heart go forth and find that joy that peace that love that lives deep inside that the world can never take away 
Go in peace, but stay for the breakout room. <laughs>